Father, thank you so much for your blessings of another Holy Sabbath, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful weather here in California. And I pray that wherever people are watching from, that you will bless them wherever they are, Lord. And as we delve into this deep subject of medical missionary work and health reform and its role in this final crisis, I pray that you give us wisdom that comes from above. And as we open your words in the scriptures, we dare not do it without the presence and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. So we want to commit this time to you now, Lord. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, our subject is the role of health reform in medical missionary work in the final crisis. Now in the work, there are three kinds of workers. You have lay workers. Those are the men with the ordinary work of life, such as auto mechanics and um, electricians, doctors and lawyers and the normal walks of life. Then we have conference workers. The conference workers are men that works for the conference, such as Bible workers, such as teachers, principals, pastors, and, they, and secretaries, et cetera, et cetera. And they get compensated by and from the general conference. Then a third kind of worker is what we call self-supporting workers. And these workers through their work support themselves as they work full-time in ministry. Now the difference between a lay worker and a self-supporting worker is oftentimes the lay worker, they have their normal nine to five and their mission field become predominantly their place of employment. So they're not necessarily full-time in the work, even though they, they recognize that their vocation and their, their, their place of, of work is their mission field. Whereas self-supporting workers, they are fully engaged and fully endowed. They don't have a regular job or a regular career. Their career and their calling is the same, just to go out and win souls for God in varying endeavors. Now, even though you have these three kind of workers, lay workers, conference workers, and self-supporting workers, there's one thing that all three of these workers have in common, and that they're all called to be medical missionaries. In fact, we're told in volume seven of the testimonies, page 62, that we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. So we have all have one common calling, that we're all called to be medical missionaries. Now, let's begin to look at what is a medical missionary. Go in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. In the book Education, that first page, Ellen White says, our idea of education is too narrow and too low. And then she said, we need a, something that's broader and wider. So most of the time when we think of medical missionary work, we think about herbs and poultices and remedies and vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. And while those are all good and a part of it, medical missionary work is much broader, much wider, and much deeper. So the medical missionary chapter in a book, in a, in a Bible is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. And we're going to begin to delve in to see what medical missionary work is all about. I, I would advise that you study this entire chapter. We're not going to do that today, obviously, with the sake of time. But verse 1 says, Cry aloud, spear not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. So since this is the medical missionary chapter, which, by the way, is the most quoted chapter in all the spirit of prophecy, Isaiah 58 and John chapter 17, this is saying that medical missionary work is designed to show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This chapter is also linked with the loud cry, cry aloud. And then you see in verse eight, the Bible says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. And you see that this, these languages are in perfect harmony with the book of Revelation chapter 13, which is the chapter of the loud cry. Uh, uh, the earth was lightened with his glory. You see that light. And the Bible also said he's cried mighty with a strong voice. So you see those two elements deeply indelved into the loud cry. But then in verse 5, the Bible said, is, is, is it such a fast that I've chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down thyself, thy head in, as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable to the Lord? Verse 6 now, it begins to tell us one of the, some of the things that medical missionaries does. It's not just about herbs and remedies. It's not just about, 
you know, vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. It's much deeper. Notice what it says here. Is it not this fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness? So this is saying that medical missionary work is rooted in loosening the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you may break every yoke. Medical missionary work is God's design to help people to put away sins in their lives and sins in the world. Now, how do you do this? Because th th this work has to be very practical. It has to be very real. You can't just go to somebody and say, uh, it's somebody who's hungry and somebody who's naked and somebody who's blind and somebody who's wretched and miserable and say, put away your sins. The first thing you have to do is minister to their practical needs. Notice what it says here in verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out, into, uh, out to thy house? When thou see the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall be, go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Again, you see this language of the loud cry, which is a closing work in this earth's history. Verse 9. Then, when you're doing this kind of work, God said, Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. So you can begin to see that God has this special work. It's a practical work. It's a real work. Yes, it includes the putting away of sins, but we also see that very clearly from the Bible that it's also linked specifically with doing a very practical work. If somebody's hungry, feed them. If somebody's naked, clothe them. It's simply following Christ's method of evangelism, which is ministering to their needs, winning their confidence, sympathizing, and then as a result of doing all of this, the Bible says, and it's greater prophecy, then you can say, come and follow me. This works become essential, it becomes important, why? Because there comes a time when there's no other work that will be done. Let me give you some inspiration on that. Council on Health, page 533, paragraph one says, I wish to tell you that soon, There'll be no work done in ministerial lines, but medical missionary work. If we have not learned to follow the counsel, to take hold of medical missionary work, inspiration is telling us here that there comes a time when our work will be shut out of business. Now, let's put some more practical and put some more flesh on this. If this message is intimately linked with the loud cry, and during the time of the loud cry, we're told that there will be no work done in ministerial lines but medical missionary work. And a part of this work is to deal thy bread to the hungry. Do you see then that as God's people, we have to have a system of living that during the loud cry, when we cannot buy and cannot sell, that we can still deal our bread to the hungry. It is very practical and it is very real. And I'll tell you that this kind of work is what God has designed to give us more time in light of religious liberty. And we're going to study that from the Bible because we're studying how medical missionary evangelism links with religious liberty. And we're going to study that. Now, Soon there'll be no work done in medical missionary line, uh, in ministry lines, but medical missionary work. Now, I want you to notice a statement here. It says, and we'll come to it. In fact, let's go to our Bibles. Let's go to our Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings. We'll look at it in our Bibles. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to see how medical missionary work is linked with religious liberty. 2 Kings chapter 6. And by the way, this is a wonderful chapter to study. This is a chapter of the School of the Prophets. The School of the Prophets was God's design to stay the apostasy in all Israel. It was God's design to train young men and young women and ministers of the gospel to truly be able to do the work that God desires for them to do. And we're told that many schools, the schools in these last days that's going to be a part of the closing work, must be modeled after the School of the Prophets. 
There's an entire chapter on it in the book, Patriots and Prophets. There's an entire chapter on it in the book, Education, on what the School of the Prophets was like. It's a very practical school. It's it a very simple school. It's a school that taught how to use your hands. It, it taught that you must learn while doing. You learn about poem. You learn about music. You learn about Bible work. You learn about evangelism. You learn about uh, canvassing work. You learn about trades. It's something worth studying. So Elijah is now passed, and he's turned over the school to Elisha. And Elisha was a very powerful man. He had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, after sharing about the wonderful things that were happening in the school of the prophets, we see here that the Syrians had surrounded the children of Israel. And as they were surrounding the children of Israel, they realized that the reason why Israel kept escaping is because they had a prophet in Israel. So the king of Syria said, you know what? We need to get to the heart of the issue. We keep trying to attack Israel themselves, but we need to get to the person that's giving them the solution to what we're doing. So the word got out that he must get rid of Elisha if he's going to find success in destroying Israel. Are you guys with me? Notice, 2 Kings now, chapter 6, verse 8. I'm just going to skip through. It says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of the up and saved himself there, not once, nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. He called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not uh, show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, tell the king of Israel, the words that thou speaketh in thy bedchamber. I say it would be well for us to all obey the prophet. What do you say? Then it says, and he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is, is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city, both with the horses and chariots and the servant, and said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So you can see the picture I have on the screen. You see that servant running to Elisha. And Elisha is as calm and as cool and as collective as can be. And the servant is puzzled. He's disturbed. He's saying, look, we are surrounded by the army of Israel. We are about to be destroyed. Elisha, how can you be so calm? I want you to notice what the Bible goes on to say. The Bible says, in verse 15, uh, verse 16 rather, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And listen to this prayer. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The point that I'm making is that there's some things that that young man could not see that Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Lord, open his eyes. And let me say this, my brothers and sisters, we are not living in ordinary time. And as I hear so many times, the blind leading the blind, which is going to lead the church to fall into a ditch, because there's so many ministers of God in this last day that are preaching peace and safety when the Bible says sudden destruction shall come upon them. This coronavirus and its impact is no ordinary time. And if we're not seeing how it relates to the end time prophecies, we must be praying and asking God, Lord, open my eyes. And if we can't see, we might be a fulfillment of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, where the Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. What gospel? 
And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. I'm speaking of the gospel, the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And there's so many that has not seen the relation and the correlation to the fact that God is showing us through the three angels and the coronavirus that we're living in a time of the end. I shared before that I believe, my brother and sister, that this is similar to the siege in Jerusalem on the Cestus. And it was a warning for the people of God that they must get their acts together before Titus comes. And as God's people, we're told that we should be embracing medical missionary work. We should be embracing country living and outpost evangelism. We should be embracing the very work that God has given us in this hour. But what are we doing? Many of us are fast asleep. And the inspiration says there are sleeping ministers preaching to a sleeping people. She called them dumb dogs that don't bark, my brothers and sisters. And I have no such message to give to you this afternoon. We see, my brothers and sisters, through this, Google and Apple and many others are doing things that are unprecedented, things that they've never done before. They're beginning to release the location information of God's people. We're seeing, my brothers and sisters, that in Kentucky, that they're beginning to take license plate and arresting those who are still gathering for religious services. Now I understand that they're, they're saying that it's as a result of staying the pandemic, but my brothers and sisters, subconsciously, we are adapting to a new norm where we're saying it is now okay for the, the, for the state to control what the church is doing. We're seeing that. We're seeing, my friends, that now YouTube is saying that we're not putting up any content that is not in guidance with who. We're going to begin to take things down. And then notice what she says here. She says, YouTube Susan, uh, YouTube Susan Wojcicki has suggested that the video platform will remove content that contradicts the World Health Organization advice on COVID-19. Then it says, for example, she said, content that claimed vitamin C or turmeric could cure people of COVID-19 would be a violation of our policy and removed accordingly. So she's saying, if you're saying things that's outside of who organization, then we're going to begin to take the videos down. Can we see, my brothers and sisters, that our liberties are beginning to be taken away? slowly but surely and as i've been mentioning week after week they begin already to link it to climate change and saying as the world is resting under COVID 19 you can see that the emissions of the world is beginning to get much better in all parts of the world and as a result our mind has been so desensitized our mind has been so adapted that people news newscasters are saying look we need to recognize that the same way you can come together throughout the world to fight this coronavirus, we need to come together to fight climate change. And as I've mentioned in the past, my brothers and sisters, that climate, uh, to, to shut down the entire economy permanently is not sustainable. The only way that this will work is if we work some days and rest some days, and the Bible predicts that it's gonna be taught and it's gonna be enforced and it's gonna be compelled, driven and moved that we must worship for six days and rest a day. Work for six days and, and rest one day. And that way it will be a solution. We can still make changes climate-wise, but at the same time sustain the economy. She says, coronavirus has shown that in order to avert the worst impact of a global crisis, world leaders need to come together to make bold changes, she says. The world has been given a trial run in the global crisis management. It should not waste it. And just this very week, on Earth Day, Pope says, nature will not forgive our trespasses. I want you to notice what he says here. He says, Pope Francis made an impassioned plea for protection of the environment on Wednesday, 50th anniversary of the first, our first Earth Day, saying the coronavirus pandemic had shown that some challenges had to be met with a global response. Then it says, both the Pope and Guterres, who's the secretary of the UN, have made environmental protection and climate change signature themes of their offices. Now notice what he says. This is, uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Guterres. Notice what he says here. He says, with many health systems and medical supply chains at breaking point, Guterres will say that while the impact of the coronavirus is both immediate and dreadful, there's an even deeper emergency he says, the planet's unfolding environmental crisis. Then he says, climate disruption is approaching a point of no return. Then he added that greenhouse gases must, like the viruses, do not respect national boundaries. 
We're seeing all these things taking place and we're blinded, my brother and sister. We must be praying, Lord, open our eyes. And I mentioned last week, I have a friend that works at Trader Joe's and he says he was shocked when he saw that Trader Joe's closed on Sundays and many other places uh, closed on, on Easter Sunday. And they say, look, as a result of this, this, this pandemic, we're going to give all of our workers a break. And they might be innocent, my friends. But again, our minds are becoming desensitized and adaptive to a new norm. In fact, notice what it says here. Uh, notice what it says here. It says, grocery store outlets. It says, shoppers line up patiently waiting to purchase their last minute produce as on Sunday, all small businesses, including grocery stores, will be closed to give employees a day of rest for the month of April. Many agree. Referring to their childhood, where everything was closed on Sundays, Millennia says. So what they're saying, they're saying, I remember when things used to be closed on Sundays. I remember everyone had a break. What am I saying? We are adapting a new norm. We're adapting a new norm. And what does it say here? We can begin to see, my brothers and sisters, that religious aggression is beginning to subvert the liberties of our nation. And what happens when this happens? She says, when we see this, she says, while we have opportunity, we should become intelligent in regard to four things, disease, its causes, prevention, and its cure. Through the coronavirus pandemic, we see that re religious liberties are beginning to be subverted. And then it says, if you want to stand for freedom of conscience, you will be placed in unfavorable compositions, but we should, while we have opportunity, become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and its cure. And those who do this will find a field of labor anywhere. And again, I mentioned, I wish to tell you that soon there'll be no work done in ministerial lines, but medical missionary work. Back to our story, because we're talking about how medical missionary work plays a role in religious liberty. So Elijah prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And when, he, when Elijah prayed, open his eyes, verse 17, I'll read it again. It says, Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. He saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote him with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Verse 19, and Elisha said unto him, this is not the way, neither is the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. Verse 20. It came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes. And they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Verse 21. The Bible says, And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? You know what I love about this? Even the king realized that he's subjected to the prophet. Even the king realized that he's subjected to the spirit of prophecy. And I wish that many of our workers within our church, many of our pastors and ministers realize that even though God has given them some authority in the church, that they are still subjected to the spirit of prophecy to ask what they should be doing. In fact, I was listening to a message. I was tempted to play it. When somebody was saying, you know, as a result of the coronavirus, you know, people are saying that we should start running to the mountains and running to the country and, 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 and growing our own foods and so on and so forth. And he's saying what we need to do is we need to stay in these cities and work. Well, that sounds good. But I haven't read that in the spirit of prophecy. In fact, um, if, you, if, you, if you actually study the spirit of prophecy, it's actually the exact opposite. If you study the life of Lot, you know what Lot said? Lot says, I'm going to stay in the cities and I'm going to work the cities. And Lot has to be rescued by his uncle, Abraham, who was living in the country. In fact, when that angel came to Abraham about Lot, Abraham was saying about Lot, I know that Lot is in the cities. I know that he has his vegetarian restaurant in the city. I know he had his city mission. I know he has his treatment rooms. Surely there's 50 souls that Lot has won. No. Surely there's 40. No. 30, 20, 10. No. 
So we've seen that, that this model of living in the cities and working in the cities is not a part of God's plan. You do not find that in the Bible. You do not find that in the spirit of prophecy. When Lot left Sodom, he was actually minus in his, in his city mission endeavor. He was minus in his soul winning endeavor. God has given us a model. Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed that we are to work the cities from our post centers. So we see, my brothers and sisters, that the king realized that he must be subjected to the spirit of prophecy. So he said, Elisha, what should I do? I want you to notice what Elisha said. So here it is that these men were blinded. And, and, and as a result of their blindness, they were taken into Samaria. And now they are surrounded by the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel saying, should I kill them? And Elisha said, no. We're going to slay them in a different way. Notice what it says in verse 22. And he answered, this is Elisha. Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with the sword and with the bow? Watch what this says, my friends. It says, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Praise God, my brother and sister. I hope you guys are seeing this. So here it is, the, the same army that was supposed to destroy uh, the, the, the Israelites. They were blinded, and when they were about to be slain, Elijah said, instead of killing them with sword, I want you to kill them with kindness. I want you to give them some bread and some water. What did Isaiah say? Is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the band of wickedness, to let the oppressed go free? Is not the fast to deal thy bread to the hungry? Now, what happened as a result? It says in verse 23, and he prepared great provisions for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. Listen. And they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel, my friends. As a result of dealing the bread to the hungry, as a result of medical missionary work, we see, my brothers and sisters, that this group under this king did not come back to Israel. And that's what it says here. Notice what Ella White says. Watch what she says now. She says here that for a time after this, Israel was free from the attacks of the Syrians. What gave them religious liberty? None other than medical missionary work. In Ellen White's time, when she was in Australia, the same thing happened. I shared it before. She said that when there was a Sunday law passed, the students were studying simple medical missionary principles. And they'll go out into the communities and they'll begin to share with the communities. They give Bible studies in the communities. They'll give natural remedy treatments in the communities. And when the Sunday law was passed there in Australia, the officers came. And when the officers came, they saw that the school, Avondale, was still working on Sundays. You know what they said? They said, I see them, but I'm not going to touch them. Why? Because I see that they have done such a great work in our communities as a result of my wife being healed of disease, as a result of my son being healed of disease. I'm not going to trouble the little work that they're doing on Sundays, my friends. And I'm not sure about you, but I say that we need more time. I say that we're not ready. I say that we need to do our very best to stay in the hand of this crisis now so we can get ourselves ready. So we can get the food growing, so we could truly be in a position to be ready for when the crisis fully breaks up, when Titus comes back. But in order to do this, we see, my brothers and sisters, we have a work to do in our communities. We need to take hold of medical missionary work, as we've been told. And sometimes we think that this, it must be complicated. It's very simple. Notice what it says here. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things in a way that will be contrary to any man's human planning. And then it says, God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins into his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. Very simple. We're going to look at it, my brothers and sisters. Medical missionary work is very simple. Now, my question is this. If we've heard, and by the way, you know, I've actually, I've actually done this. I've gone to church, churches, and I've done this in a few places. And I'll read the statement. Well, before I read the statement, I'll say, how many of us are church members? 
You see like 99% of the church raise their hand and say, I'm a church member. Then I said, hands down. Then I said, how many of us in this church now that are church members are medical missionaries? And then you see maybe one, two, maybe 10 hands go up, depending on the size of the church. When inspiration says we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Every member. But yet most churches, you have one, maybe two, maybe five hands raised. So my question is, why are not more people doing this kind of work when we're told that this is the very last work? Well, going about to the book of Luke chapter 14, I'll tell you why. Luke chapter 14. God has given us the three things that's hindering people from getting into this work. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Notice what it says here. In verse 16. It says, Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many. And he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Before I go any further, let me share with you what that supper represents. In the book, Christ Our Blessings, page 221, it says, By the great supper, Christ represents the blessings offered through the gospel. The provision is nothing less than Christ himself. So as we look at the supper, this is no ordinary supper. Christ said, the supper represents me. So as you see these men rejecting the supper, they're not just rejecting a meal, they are rejecting God himself. And by the way, the supper is found in Revelation chapter 19. The supper is in heaven, my friends. So because they're rejecting Christ, who represents the supper, they're also rejecting their entrance into heaven. So he invited them, and they all said that they'll come. And then he says, servant, go back and let them know that the supper is ready now. And he says, let them all know that it's ready and let them all come. Come for all things are now ready. Verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. They agreed, I'll come. Now the supper is ready. The Bible says they began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Now, how do we know that's an excuse? He already owned the land. And because he already bought it, what difference does it make if he looks at the land now or after the supper? Verse 19, another said, I have bought five milk of oxen. I go prove them. I pray thee, have me excuse. Again, he has already bought the oxen. What difference does it make at this point if he proves the oxen now or before? It's already his. What difference does it make? Verse 20, another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Again, he already married the wife. And as I said about this oftentimes, if he married a wife that's not willing to go to the supper that represents Christ, then he's married the wrong wife. So the servant came and showed him the Lord's these things, and he answered, Master of the house, being angry and sent to his, his servant, go. He says, go, go where? Go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes, into the cities, and bring in the, hither the poor, medical missionary work, the maimed, medical missionary work, the halt, medical missionary work, and the blind, medical missionary work. And we're going to see that. And then the Lord said unto the servant, it is done. And then he says, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Now, in Luke chapter 14, you see that there are three categories of excuses that people make to not come to the marriage supper. Number one, earthly possessions. Number two, business enterprises. Number three, earthly relationships. That's why Jesus says, if you, do, if you love father and mother more than me, then you're not worthy of me. He's saying, set things in proper priority order. Now, as we look at this story, we don't want to just think, as we look at this parable, it's not just to say that, you know, these are the excuses that people are going to make when I give a Bible study or when I try to get somebody to come to the banquet. You're going to notice that these are the very same excuses that we make when God has called us to be medical missionaries, when God has called us to go into the highways and hedges, when God has called us to go and use the missionary endeavors that he's given us and all the skills and the tools because we have been rejecting the very thing that God has given us to take this work throughout the world. So we see that they rejected it. Now, what does this represent? 
Notice what this says. It says the medical missionary workers are doing the long and neglected work which God has gave to the which God gave to the church in Battle Creek. Now watch this. They are giving those next three words, the last call to the supper he has prepared. Notice it says he's given the last call that has been prepared. Notice it says, why has it not been understood that the word of God, by the word of God, that the work being done in medical missionary lines is a fulfillment of the scripture, go out into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And then it says, watch what it says here. This is the work that the churches in every locality, north and south, east and west should do. The churches have been given the opportunity of answering this work. Why have they not done it? Someone must fulfill the commission. So she's asking, why has not the church taken hold of this work? Why did they not realize that this call, the very last call that God has given to the marriage supper, the very last call that's found in Revelation chapter 18, the loud cry of the third angel, the very last call that's married with Isaiah chapter 58. She said the very last call that soon there'll be no work done in ministry lines, but medical missionary work. She says, why have the church not taken hold of this? My question is this, my brothers and sisters, will it happen? Yes, it will. The supper will take place. You know what hinders it? The people of God. And there's some who are trained, who are still not taking hold of this work. Now let me ask this question. If Satan knows that medical missionary work would lead to the supper, would he distract medical missionaries? Does Satan understand the importance of medical missionary work? Does he understand the connection with health reform and the closing work? And the answer is yes. Now, if he does, what two things would he do? Number one, he would use it himself. He said, I see that medical missionary work is so essential and I would be like the Most High. My goal is to overthrow the kingdom of God and I see how essential and important this is. So number one, I'm going to use this very work on myself. As we mentioned, medical missionary work is a helping hand of the gospel. It's, a, it is, it is, um, it's medical missionary work. It is the gospel with flesh on it. It's the revelation of Christ. It's simply going about doing good. Revealing Christ through our labors, revealing Christ through just ministering to whatever needs people have. This is medical missionary work at its heartbeat, ministering to the needs and winning their confidence. But in the great controversy, as I mentioned, Satan is going to use it himself. We're going to see that Satan recognizes, and you can go back and study in history, that the method that he ultimately wants to use, which is force, it does not work fully. He tried it during the dark ages. And after a while, you know what Satan said? He said, by this force, it's actually going against me. It's counterproductive. Because as they see those martyrs slain on that cross, as they see those martyrs burned at that stake, as they see the guillotine cut down on their heads and their heads are being slashed off, Satan began to realize that this is just seeds sown to the gospel. Every blood that's shed is a seed that brings forth more fruit. It got to the point where they say, no, no more public martyrdom. So while Satan will get back to force, according to Revelation chapter 13, Satan says, I cannot just use force all the time. I must mingle force with deception. So while he uses fear and force, he also uses deceptions and inducements. When you study Revelation chapter 13, in fact, let's go there. Let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Are you guys still with me? Revelation 13. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. It says, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. This is speaking of the United States now. So we see that it first starts off with deception. And then in verse 17 now, 16 rather, and then it says, and causeth all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So in the beast power that's combined in Revelation 13, which is the United States and Rome, we see that they use two things. They use deception and they also use force. Question, which one of them is being used right now? 
But we don't see anyone being persecuted and martyred here in the United States. We don't see anyone persecuted and being martyred in Rome. So that tells us that we're in a phase right now that they're used in deception in Revelation 14 through 15. But then you get to Revelation 15, 16, and 17 when it transitions, and then you see that it's going to transition now from deception to force. The Bible speaks to the United States and says it had two horns like a lamb. In other words, it first came on under, uh, under the, uh, as a Christian nation where, you know, uh, 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 it's going by the principles governed by the Bible. But then something happens, and the Bible says it had two horns like a lamb, but then eventually it speaks as a dragon. And if you want to know how a dragon speaks, go to Revelation 12. The Bible said that the dragon persecuted the woman. So while the United States right now is considered a Christian nation, the Bible says that when church and state begins to, separate, uh, to unite, and not, no longer be separate, when republicanism and Protestantism are no longer separate, which are the hallmarks of the United States government, once they begin to combine, then we're told that they repudiate the principles of their constitution, and then the end will begin to come in. So we can see this, this transition taking place. So we see that both Rome and United States are using deception as a means, and we're going to see, show you that the deception that they're using is none other than medical missionary work. We're going to show it. So in the Revelation 13, the prophecy predicts, now watch what it says, law enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath will bring about a national apostasy from the principles of republicanism upon which the government has been founded. Then it says the religion of the, of, of the papacy will be accepted by the rulers and the law of God will be made void. So what is this saying in Revelation 13? It's saying that you're going to see two dynamics. You're going to see that the United States is going to be going down morally. And at the same time, you're going to see Rome rising to prominence. So as one goes down, the other comes up. It reversed the process because when you look at Revelation 13, verse 10, you see that one is going down and one is coming up. In a physical sense, while Rome is going down in 1798, the Bible says the United States will be coming up in 1798. And it's not too long after that the United States declared its independence. After the French Revolution came in, and, and under Napoleon and, and, and General Berthier that the Pope was captured, not too long after that, the United States came up. But the process is going to reverse because the United States is going to go down morally while they go up, while Rome is going up in prominence. Let's keep that in mind. But how will these two powers combine? Does the United States have enough power to enforce worldwide worship? And the answer is no. I'm sorry, does Rome have enough power to enforce worldwide worship? And the answer is no. Where will they get the power from? None other than the United States of America. And that's why a part of the fulfillment of prophecy is that the United States has to become the most powerful and dominant power in the entire world. Because the Bible says in verse 16 that he causes or forces all, both small, great, free, and bond, rich, and poor, to receive a mark in their right hand and their foreheads. So it cannot enforce all unless it has enough power to drive and force all. Watch what it says in verse 15. Bob says, and he, the United States, had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So it said the United States is the one that has power to give life to Rome. That the image of the beast should both speak and, and force or cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. In order for this to take place, the United States would have to become the most powerful nation in the world. Has that happened? Notice what this says. There are five reasons why the United, why the United States remain the world's only superpower. Only suggests that the United States wields enough power more than any other country in the world. Notice what this says. It says a superpower is a country that wields enough military, political, and economic might to, now watch this, to convince nations in all parts of the world to do things they otherwise would not. So as you look at this now, we're told that the United States has enough power to force or cause nations in all parts of the world to do things that they otherwise would not. I hope that you're getting what this is saying, my friends. So the United States right now has enough power to force 
other countries to do things that they otherwise would not do. You see that in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15. Now watch. So we see prophecy predicts that the United States will go down morally at the same time Rome will be rising to prominence. And has the United States gone down morally? We see that all throughout the U.S. People are recognizing America's role on uh, uh, America's morals on crash course towards Rome. Now, this is from uh, Washington, the Washington Times two years ago. It says the United States is in a worse position morally than ever before. Decline in moral morality in the United States of America. 82% and 78% of, uh, of Democrats and Republicans said that the United States, that moral values have been depleted. All over we see that the United States has gone down morally. We see it with the legalization of marijuana. We see it with the legalization of homosexuality and, uh, and, 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 and same-sex marriage and so on and so forth. So we see that the United States is going down, but my question is this. The Bible says that as the United States go down morally, do we see that Rome is coming up into ascendancy? Because the prophecy predicts that while one goes down, the other comes up. Let's see how Rome is going to come about this ascendancy. Watch what this says. It says, Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In those countries where Catholicism is not in ascendancy, and the papists are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence. Now, what does that mean? That means it's going to conceal its ultimate agenda by, in a deceptive way, think that it has the best interests of the world, but this will be the means in which Rome will be utilizing to rise to its ascendancy. I hope that this is making sense. In fact, the Bible also predicts it. Let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Daniel, chapter 8. Are we, are, we, are we still studying, my brother and sister? Are you there? Give me a thumbs up if you're still with me. Praise God. We're still together. Amen. Daniel chapter 8. Let's notice what's taking place here. After speaking of uh, Medo Persia and Greece in verse 21 of Daniel chapter 8, the Bible says, Now that being broken where us, four stood up, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nations, but not in its power. Watch what it says now in verse 23. Watch. It says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressions are now of, of to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Now, when you think of person that understanding dark sentences, you know what that is? That is the Jesuit order. And then it says in verse 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Now listen, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. But how? And through his policy, also he shall cause craft, that means deception, to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by, uh, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against a prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. What does it say, my friends? This is saying in the last days, there's going to be a king that's fierce, that's mighty, that's powerful. But it's not going to destroy his power by going and just wiping out nations. It's not going to destroy his power by going and, and, and martyring the Christians. It's not going to wield its power by saying people need to do this or else. It says his power is going to be through craft. His power is going to be through peace. His power is going to be through deception. And as a result, he said, it's going to cause him to be more prosperous than any other king that has existed. Now, my friends, let me ask you this question. Has Rome changed? Do we know of any king or any leader or any ruler now in Rome that the Bible talks about that is using craft, that is using peace, that is using deception, as a means of regaining the power and prestige of Rome. Do we see that? In fact, when he mentioned that he was a Jesuit, he pretty much unfolded the cards in his hands because great controversy canvasses the agenda of Jesuits. And Pope Francis openly says that he is a Jesuit. I wonder if Jesuits change. I wonder if Rome has changed. I wonder now if as a result of all the wonderful things that he's doing all around the world and causing nations and countries to come together and saying we need to come together to fix our common world. 
are coming home. I wonder if now that means Rome has changed. I remember I was doing a message in Atlanta when somebody approached me after I did a message that taught unfolding the cards that's in Pope Francis and Rome's hand. I said, I'm glad you shared with this with me because I was beginning to wonder if Rome is still the beast power. Because I see all the wonderful things that this man is doing. I, I, and I, in my mind, I begin to say, I guess Rome has changed. Oh, no, my friends. He showed his cards. And let me see, show you what great controversy said. Notice what it says here. It says, throughout Christendom, listen carefully. Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. This time, what did they do? The order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. So this is saying they realized that they could not take out the Christians. They realized that the Christians were banned together in the cause of Christian love. They realized that the martyring and the killing and the slaying was not fruitful anymore. In fact, it was working against them. It was counterproductive because the more they killed is the more Christians were born. So they said, we have to do something else. They said, we're going to create what's called the Jesuit order. But notice it says here, it is the most cruel. Now, man says he's a Jesuit. Now, I'm just telling you what the prophet of God says. She says, Jesuits are the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Now, I wonder if Rome has changed. Listen, listen, my brothers and sisters. It says, cut off from earthly tides and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affections, reason and conscious holy silence, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order and no duty but to extend its power. So as I said, I don't care how much feet that man kisses. Rome has not changed. I don't care how many uh, palm branches they plant for peace. We're told Rome has not changed. They know no rule, no tie, but that to extend the Jesuit order. So everything that we're seeing him doing right now is a means of the deception because there is a means to the end of everything that Rome does. Listen. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet dangers and endure suffering undisplayed by, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty to uphold the banner of truth in the face of the rack, the dungeons, and the stake. Then it says to combat these forces. Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. Do you get this, my friends? So they're saying, look, the Christians, they are so faithful. They are unshakable. They are unmovable. Their faith is so fixed that we must develop people who have the same mindset. They too must be willing, if they're going to overthrow the Christians, to endure hunger. They too must be willing to, like the Christians, endure hardships and danger and toil and, and coldness. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of what? Of deception, my friends. Now remember, as you look at Revelation chapter 13, let's go back there. I want you to see this very clearly because in Revelation chapter 13, the Bible tells us what's going to be used most of the time. Persecution and force will come, but only after the deception has been prominent. So from now until the Sunday law, my friends, we must be looking out for the deception rather than the force. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 14, And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of men. So what are we looking for? We're looking for deception. Now watch. Watch what it says here. It said, There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vow to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of what? Of papal supremacy. So what is it saying? No matter what we see taking place in Rome right now, I don't care what you see that man called Pope Francis doing right now, my friends. 
We're told that there's one agenda that Jesuits have. And they'll use disguise and they will not go through any, they're, they're willing to devote themselves to it in to such a way that it does not matter what they endure. Then it says, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity. Visiting prisons, do we see them visiting prisons? Visiting hospitals, do we see them visiting hospitals? Ministering to the sick and the poor, do we see them ministering to the sick and the poor? Professing to have renounced the world, do we see that? He said, you know what, I'm not going to uh, drive the Pope mobile. I'm not going to wear the papal shoes, I'm not going to live in, the, in a fancy place, I'm just going to live in a simple apartment. Professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good but under the blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. Deception. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justify the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassinations were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. On the various disguises again, deception, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to the councils of kings and shaping the policy of nation. Question, has Rome changed, my friends? Do we, see, now, do we now believe that as a result of all the wonderful things that's going, going on, that Rome has changed? Well, let me give you some inspired answer. He said, the papal church will never relinquish her claim of infallibility. All that she has done in the persecution of those who reject her dogmas, she holds to be right. And would, not, would she not repeat the same acts should she, uh, through the opportunity be presented? Then it says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed. Is it going to happen? Yes. And Rome be reinstated into the former power. Does it say it's going to happen? Revelation 13, 15 says, and he has, speaking of the United States, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So Revelation 13 and verse 15 says that what we're seeing here on the screen is going to happen. Rome will be given a power once again. And once that restraint is removed and is given as power by secular governments, we're going to see, my brothers and sisters, that the tyranny and the persecution will be revived speedily, as the statement has said. So we see that Rome will, in fact, regain its power. But how? We see that it's clearly by deception. Now, as a result... Right now, Pope Francis is the most popular man in all the world. Pope more popular than world leaders, Pope says. More popular than anyone else in the world. Now, how did he get this popularity? And notice he's liked by atheists. He's liked by agnostics. He's liked by Protestants. Every, I mean, Protestants and, 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 and like in Rome is to... It, it's, too, it's oxymoronic. It, it, it doesn't go together. The reason why you're Protestant is you're protesting against the dogmas of Rome. Now, my question is this. How did he get so popular? Look at these statements. Watch what it says here. It says, God shows his love, not with great speeches, but with simple, tender acts of charity, Pope Francis says. When Jesus wants to teach us how a Christian should be, he tells us very little, the Pope said, but he shows people by feeding the hungry and welcoming the stranger. Now, my friend, does this not seem directly out of the book of Isaiah chapter 58? Does this not seem as if what Christ said he will utilize in these last days as a means of reaching the people does this not seem that this is being used by this power right now? Deception, my friends. He does not, how does God show his love? These are quotes from uh, Pope Francis with great things. No, he becomes small with gestures of tenderness, goodness, he said. God stoops low and gets close. You have an entire website that's developed to all the wonderful things that Pope Francis did. He dished the Pope Mobile. He's prioritizing helping the poor and the sick, touching those that are sick and defamed, not condemning lesbians, kissing the feet of prisoners. Remember we say he goes to prisoners? He be uh, prisons, uh, became native with the, product, the Amazons. He comforted the rape victims. He uh, went around feeding the hungry in the Vatican, uh, sold his luxurious motorcycle to fund a hostile and suit group uh, for the poor. Did not despise atheists. He spoke 
uh, about the evil of global financial system. He condemns child abuse. You see, intervened in the Syrian war. He donated Vatican employees' uh, bonuses to charity. He ridiculed the church's obsession with abortions, gay marriage, and contraception. See, he reaches out to the other faiths, urging everyone to respect each other. These are all wonderful things that they say. He takes selfies with people. Oh, how nice of the Pope. Nice Popey. He let the children uh, hug him in, on stage and, and, and use their chair. Oh, how nice. I wonder if Rome has changed now. He has a sense of humor. He fired the Bishop of Bling, who was misusing and abusing the money in Rome to, to, to build up his own wealth and, 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 and buy all these fanciful things for himself. But as you look at this, and look at the statements that has been made, it takes us right back to the Ministry of Healing, page 143, where it says, there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. The poor are to be relieved, the sick care for, the song and the bereaved comforted. Weep with those who weep uh, uh, and, 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 and rejoice that with those who re rejoice. Then it says, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of love of God, this work will not and cannot be without fruit. What is he doing? He's simply following Christ's method of evangelism. Because we're told Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and he won their confidence. Then he bade them come and follow me. And that's next. Notice what it says in Revelation 13, verse 3 now. After you win the confidence of the people, watch what it says here, Re Revelation 13, verse 3. The Bible says, And I saw one of his heads as he were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Oh, my friends, we see the implications coming right now. And we see that the Pope Francis in Rome is utilizing the method that God has given to his church to go about doing good in the work of medical missionary work. So we see, number one, that he's using it himself. That's the first thing we mentioned. But we also mentioned, number two, that he will try to prevent the church from using it. Watch what it says here. The work is he tries to bring in methods that will attract the worldly-minded, supposing that this will remove the objections that they will feel to take up the cross. It says, lessens his influence. Then it goes on to say, preserve the simplicity of godliness. So we see that number one, they're using it himself, themselves. But number two, Rome is going to try to prevent the church from using it. Is it important then that those who are not trained as medical missionaries get trained? And the answer is yes. Is it important then that those who are trained as medical missionaries actually engage in the work? And the answer is yes. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of seven things that in my experience that I see that hinders the success of medical missionaries utilizing the work that God has given them. Number one, a lot of medical missionaries, we are unconverted ourselves. And the Bible says, freely you have received, so freely give. Such as I have, give I thee. On an airplane, I always listen to these announcements. It always says, secure your oxygen mask before helping others. That sounds selfish? No, my friends. You're no help to others if we're not a help to ourselves. So number one, we must ensure that we are practicing what we're preaching. We must be utilizing the work that God has given us as a medical missionary. And notice what it says here. It says, Christ lived the life. He didn't proclaim, but he lived the life of a genuine medical missionary. We should desire, uh, he desires us to study his life diligently that we may learn to labor as he labored. You're saying study life of Christ and learn to labor as Christ labored. Christ, a great medical missionary, lived a perfect life, setting an example that all may safely follow. Number one, unconverted ourselves. Number two, we always feel that we need more training. We feel that what we have is not good enough and we need to get more. Well, true education tells you that you learn as you do. In fact, notice what um, Pastor Elder, uh, Elder Darren Dallin Oak says. He says, you can never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need won't satisfy you. 
We always say, you know, if I just had some more training, I'll do a wonderful work for God. And you get some more training. You know, you say, if I just had some more training, I can do a wonderful work for God. Then you get more training. Then you say, if I just had a little bit more training, I could do such a mighty work from God, for God. And then we, we're bouncing from institution to institution. We go from Wildwood to Uchi Pines to, uh, to Weimar to, you know, Living Springs and many other institutions. We're just bouncing around getting training and training and training and training. And we're not doing any work. The best way to get going and work is as you learn, impart. That's true education. As you learn, you begin to teach. So my wife and I started in this work. Everything that we learned, we began to share. And I realized, and you should realize as well, if you're trained already, that people don't know what you don't know. Does that make sense? So because you're trained, you know more than they know, and they don't know what you don't know. So what you begin to teach them, what you know, is more than what they know. And you get yourself in bind sometimes. You know, sometimes people ask you a question. And you say, I have no idea. But guess what? You're going to go study it. You're going to dig deeper. And as you study these things and practice these principles, then guess what? You now begin to learn the things that you thought you didn't know or the things that you might not have known. Like the demoniacs who had no training. They didn't hear any words from the master's lips. They simply were told, but they could tell what they knew. It's the same thing for us. Go and tell what we know, my friends. Number three. We go back to doing the same thing that we were doing before without applying the principles that we have learned. Now, it's not to say that we cannot continue in our, you know, if, we, if God calls us to be a mechanic or God calls us to be a carpenter, or if God calls us to be an electrician, it's not to say that we don't continue in the career path that God has chosen for us. But the question is, how do we marry that with medical missionary work? And that's what she says here. She says, who's called? She said, to everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Then she names them, the minister, the missionary nurse, the Christian physician, the individual Christian, the merchant, the farmer, the professional man, the mechanic, the carpenter, the blacksmith. She says, all of these are alike called to be medical missionaries. She says, every enterprise in which we engage should be a means to the end to get the gospel to the world. So don't think that, you know, I, I, I'm just going to go back to doing what I was doing and not use what God has given me. Use it, my friends. Number four, there are many who seek for popularity. You know, we see others who, you know, have uh, lots of views on YouTube or many are traveling all over the place and so on and so forth. And we think, you know, I, in order to be a medical missionary, I have, to, I have to be popular. I have to, you know, I have to have a name for myself. In fact, the Bible says, that when you seek a name for yourself, according to Genesis chapter 11, you're going to fall. When you look at the book of Acts, it says Judas and Thutis try to make a name for themselves. And the Bible says that they carried many men away, but then they fell themselves, my friends. So in Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5, the Bible says, Seek thou good things for thyself, seek them not. Get back to the simplicity of the work, my friends. Do what God has called you to do in a very simple and practical way, and then God will bless your efforts and spread the work. Number five, they allow business to crowd out ministry. You must have good business principles. You must also have good ministry principles. And they must be married. When business, good business principles and good ministry principles are understood, they become one. But there's times that medical missionaries, they are so caught up in finances and money that they lose sight of the very blessings that God has given us. Forgetting about Ananias and Sapphira. Forgetting about that man that tried to buy the gospel from Paul, uh, from Peter rather. And Peter said, thy money perish with thee. So what am I saying? We must never put money in front of mission. I'm not saying don't practice good principles. But remember, there's a calling and there's a career. Your calling is what you're made for. Your career is what you paid for. And your calling trumps your career. Now, one of the problems with medical missionaries, and I mentioned this in a time past, I think it was last week, I said medical missionary work, like his divine author, has been crucified between two thieves. There's some things that's stealing away from medical missionary work right now. Number one, the thief of professionalism and the thief of commercialism. Some have the mindset that you cannot be a medical missionary unless you're a doctor, unless you're a nurse, unless you're a nurse practitioner, unless you're a 
physician assistant. You cannot be a medical missionary. This is erroneous, my friends, because we're told we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Now, doctors and, 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 and nurse practitioners and uh, uh, physician assistants and, and nurses, once they get hold of these principles, they, they become the great medical missionary. Dr. Kellogg was absolutely great. Why? Because he understood the science in addition to the, 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 the spiritual principles at some point. Now, he lost it. But never allow our minds to think that we have to be some kind of professional to carry forth simple work. Never, my brother and sister, think that medical missionary work must be commercialized before we can carry out the simple plan that God has given us. These are the two thieves that medical missionary work is being crucified between. And don't let them steal the medical missionary vandalism that God has given us. In balancing medical missionary lines, what it says here, it says there is a danger of the workers losing sight of the work of soul saving as they carry forward the business part of the enterprise, there is danger that the business part of the work will allow, be allowed to crowd out the spiritual part. Don't do it, my friends. And then number six, there's some that focus on health rather than the gospel. It's easy to sell health, but we haven't learned how to transition them from health to him. A lot of uh, canvases do that as well. They, you know, they sell the foods that heal and the cookbooks and the health books, but no efforts are put forth to sell God great controversy. Why? Because those books are easy sales and it brings money in their pockets and they're, they're, they're afraid of offending by giving them the gospel through the book Great Controversy, the gospel through the book Steps of Christ and so on, the gospel through the book Christ Object Lessons, the gospel through the book Ministry of Healing. So they try to focus on the easy sales so that they can be, no, don't do that, my friends. They focus on the health without the gospel. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but it's uh, uh, not, not time to go through it, but when the medical missionary work seemed to be at its prominence, and why says medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. The meaning of genuine medical missionary work is known by was few. Why? She said, Jesus' plan has not been followed. This statement was made in 1907, and this is when Dr. Kellogg said that, you know, medical missionary work is growing. You know, uh, you know we, we, we went from 106 to, in 1866 to 7,006 patrons during the year 1906. He said, we have grown. You know, Ellen White says, I see an infant. Medical missionary work at that time was 40 years old, but Ellen White says, I see only arrested development. And what was taking place? Even though he was having all these prestigious and powerful people come from all around the world, the King of Edward and the 27th president and Thomas Edison and Amelia Earnhardt and Warren Harding and 29th president and Henry Ford and James Cash Penny and Rockefeller and Harvey Stone and Sojourner Truth. And even though it was the largest health institution in the world, Ellen White said, it is still an infant. Why? Because you are not following the Savior's plan. And what did Christ do? He combined medical missionary work with the gospel. So number uh, six, I believe that was, is that we must ensure that what we do is linked with the gospel. It says here, if a sanitarium connected with the closing message fails to lift up Christ and the principles of the gospel as developed in the third angel's message, it fails in its most important feature and contradicts the very object of its existence. But we don't want to do that. The object of medical missionary work is to point sin sick men and women to the man of Calvary who taketh away the sins of the world. And really quick, medical missionary work, when done properly, is a means to an end. Uh, we won't go through that for the sake of time. We'll save that from another, for another study. Number seven, there's some people that focuses too much or solely on inner reach. You know, we have to fix the problems of the church first before we can go out. Now, I understand the mindset. I understand that there's some internal work that needs to be done in our churches at times, but you know, in my 12 years of ministry, I've never seen a church fixed that we can say, you know, let, 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 let's start evangelizing now because the church is fully fixed. But the fact that we're there means the church needs some work, amen? So go forward in God's work, do the very best to revive the church because we're told that the church does need revival and does need reformation. But let me tell you this, my friends, if you're constantly waiting for the church to be fixed before you do this work, you'd be waiting for a very long time. And that's the same thing that happened in the time of the apostles. They began to congregate in Jerusalem and, and say, we have to protect Jerusalem from, from the, the assails of the enemy and from the, 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 the deceptions that's coming in. And, you know, and God said, you know what? Because you guys are not going out, I'm going to send persecution in Jerusalem to scatter you guys so you can go and spread the gospel throughout the world. And that's what it says here. It says the disciples would linger there for too long, unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world. 
forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. So God is saying, go out. Go out in a simple way. And I found this article in um, Adventist Review. And it shared that in the, in, 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 it gave the link with the COVID crisis in 2019 to what took place in the Spanish flu. And the people that found the most success during the time of the Spanish flu was the Adventists who were doing hydrotherapy. Watch what this says, and then we'll close. It says, lesson from Adventist Review, Adventist Institution during the 1918 flu. It says, Curtis Wood was in his early 20s when he was sent home to a, from a military base in Georgia deathly ill with the Spanish flu. Thankfully, his family lived across the street from a small Seventh-day Adventist sanitarium. Praise God, my friends. Curtis was given hydrotherapy treatment at home. Then it says, his now 95-year-old daughter credits these treatments with saving his life. He lived until 94, she says. The family would talk about how sick he had been and how wonderful it was that he got better. That's his daughter now that's 95 years old. Let's talk about the COVID-19, it says. Watch what it says. It says, Adventist schools beat the Spanish flu. It says, when a deadly flu descended upon the Adventist seminary in Hutchinson City, Minnesota, the outlook seemed grim. The Spanish flu was known to be usually fatal for young adults, but some surprising things happened as evidenced by the report validated by the town's health officer. At least 120 people on campus were exposed to the flu, all housed under one roof. Although 90 of them developed symptoms, not a single person developed pneumonia or died. These results were remarkable compared to a national and worldwide statistic. This is especially noteworthy since there were no medications available at the time to use for their treatment. What treatment did these patients receive? The physicians prescribed them strict bed rest, regulated diet, hot and cold hydrotherapy treatments provided by nurses and, uh, who monitor their care. The patients were required to remain in bed and follow social distancing up for, for a week of recovery. And then it says success attributed to hydrotherapy was also reported on other Adventist campuses, including Southern Missionary College, now Southern, Southern Lan Lancaster Academy, Academy, according to an account of Southern Lancaster Academy. While the majority of cases were of a mild type, some were very serious and would undoubtedly have resulted in fatalities. Then it says, but hydrotherapy treatments applied by students' hands under the directions of one of our own physicians wrought marvel in speedy recovery of our most difficult cases. Then it says doctors who had patients dying day by day marvel at the fact that in our large and crowded dormitories with practically no professional nurses in attendance, we had no fatalities. Praise the Lord. Then it says for ourselves, we attributed under God to the fact that we put into operation the methods of treating the sick which for years we have been part of our denominational belief. Not only are we grateful for the recovery of our sick, but we believe the experience we have passed through as a school has deepened our faith in these God-given principles. It goes on. It says, undoubtedly other natural remedies such as fresh air, sunshine, good diet, physical exercise, and adequate sleep also played an important role in these outcomes. And then it says, in a fascinating report in the, a titled Sanitarium Treatment of Influenza, Data collected uh, from 10 Adventist sanitariums in different parts of the United States that used hydrotherapy as a part of their treatment for the Spanish flu. It says, in a total, 1,123 patients were included in the report. Of these, 446 were treated as patients, inpatients, and 677 were treated as outpatients. Only 1.3% of inpatients died. And of those treated as outpatients, 3.8% died. These numbers seem consequential since the death rates of the general public treated in the hospital range from 13% to 40%. The death rates for soldiers at the U.S. Army Hospital considered the most advanced treatment centers at the time was at 6.7%. What accounted for this significantly large mortality rates of, uh, compared to the other hospitals? According to the report, the principal merit as far as treatment was concerned was the place in the careful nursing and hydro. Uh, hydrotherapy, putic uh, treatments. And then it says, and if practical properly, if practiced properly, the simple low risk, low cost, and easily employed hydrotherapy techniques such as alternative hot and cold waters are unlikely to do any harm to otherwise healthy people and might just do some good. In addition uh, to the usefulness of hydrotherapy in 1918 flu pandemic also taught us valuable lessons about the use of air, sunlight, prayer, sleep, and other natural remedies. My brother insists, and then it gives the instruction on how to do the 
out of therapy. What am I saying? God has given us some simple means. And right here at Weimar, you can go to a website called tciweimar.com, tciweimar.com, and you find there practical videos that, you know, Weimar has been putting out on how to boost immunity, how to utilize hydrotherapy, and some natural things that we could do to prevent, and in some case, even overcoming the new pandemic that we're facing right now. So you want to check that out, tciweimar.com. But what am I saying? God is calling us back to a simple principle that he's given us many years ago, to become medical missionaries. She says here, there should be 100 workers, 100 believers actively engaged in personal missionary work where now there's but one. And she said, time is rapidly passing. How few of us are heart to heart with the Redeemer in our solemn closing work. My friends, if you have not yet embraced this God-given work in these last days, God is calling you right now to a sacrificial work that we can utilize in these last days to change our course from this to this. And I pray that we have truly come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. And my question for you now, if you have not done so already, is will you answer the call? Will you be a medical missionary? Will you follow the pattern of Christ? Will you take these simple principles to bring the gospel to a dying world? As it said to those in the apostolic times, it said they did not realize that they held the bread in their hand. Notice what it says here. It says, they knew that they held in their hands the bread of life for a famishing world. The Lord wrought them. Wherever they went, the sick were healed and the poor had the gospel preached unto them. My friends, this is a calling now. My question for you is, will you answer that call? I trust and pray that by God's grace, we realize that we're living in surely solemn times and object in a mirror is much closer than they appear. And that by God's grace, we'll take hold of this work in these last days. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us these simple principles, Lord, that we need to be medical missionaries in a very simple and a very practical way. And I pray, Lord, as we recognize that we are living in a crisis now, and that you will give us a reprieve by your grace because we're not ready. But this time is time that we should ensure that we're doing our very best to get the training and to see the work in the right light that you desire for us now. So I pray like Elisha prayed, Lord, that you open all of our eyes, that we may see that they that are for us are more than they that are against us. But we must be in harmony with the work that you've given us. Now I pray like Elijah, Lord, as we take hold, Elisha, as we take hold of this medical missionary work now to deal our bread to the hungry, and unmask the blind eyes of those that surround us. That this will be a means of buying more time so that we can get a hold of this message. For we ask in Jesus' name. Shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph. Like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim.